Day in the life of a stay-at-home married girlfriend living in Canada. This is my personal chef. I don't like cooking much, so he makes me breakfast every morning. For my morning routine, I had my estheticians come over. I couldn't decide between a facial or eyebrow threading. They were $1,700 each, so I got them both. Then I got in my self-driving Civic because it's like better for the environment and had my personal driver take me to this really high-end place for dinner. They give free jewelry with their food. Look at how gorgeous this ring is. I really liked it, so I did end up buying it. And this appetizer was delicious. A stay-at-home girlfriend? A stay-at-home girlfriend? Now, I knew somebody was trying to pull me to the dark side when these stay-at-home girlfriend TikToks started showing up on my For You page. My For You page, of all people. The brown girl that's been in survival mode her entire life and literally had to work for everything. Everything. Now, this may be an unpopular opinion and fantasies may get ruined and bubbles may burst. But I want to present my thesis and get a discussion started on why I think this feminine energy or receiving rather than doing essentially the stay-at-home girlfriend culture is very toxic and a horrible message to be sending out to all the young girls out there. Hi guys, what's going on? My name's Yusra. Welcome back to my channel. Now for all those that may not know, the title is self-explanatory. It's where a girlfriend stays at home, uh, essentially doesn't work and uses her feminine energy to receive benefits from her boyfriend. There are for the most part no kids involved and I'm gonna let TikTok do the rest of the explaining. This is my day in the life as a stay-at-home girlfriend. The first thing I do is take my aloe shot. I love having this on an empty stomach and I take my greens then I get straight to making Luke's coffee because he's definitely a caffeine first thing in the morning kind of guy. I am adding some honey and cream and I made these cookies yesterday so I'm going to give him a couple of those to eat with his coffee. And then I sit down and do some journaling and some reading and then I get to making myself a matcha. Now, I want to start off digressing and I have a little story time for you guys, but I promise this is all going to connect to the topic that we're talking about. My husband and I, we have been on the hunt for a house for at least the past, I would say, 10 months. And so we were looking, we were looking, we were looking, we weren't finding anything we liked. And then finally, 10 months into the process, we actually came across the one, the property that we were like, okay, we have to have this. We're going to place an offer on this house. We try our best to make it like the highest offer we can possibly make it. You know, it was definitely outside of our budget, but I was literally like, you know what? We'll travel less, I'll buy less clothes, whatever, but we really need to make it work. Lo and behold, the next day, our realtor calls us, right? He goes, oh yeah. Um, sorry guys, but the buyer decided to take the best offer because it was all cash. Oh, and by the way, yeah, um, yeah, it came from somebody that had generational wealth. That term, generational wealth, still haunts me till today, even though this happened a little while ago. Now, what is the point of this entire story? I'm going to tell you the point, okay? The point is, is that there are rich people. And then there's everybody else. And the rich people always win. And so tying it all together, what I've noticed is that this stay-at-home girlfriend culture is essentially applicable to those that have access to generational wealth or that come from generational wealth themselves. We are also stunned that these girls have all the time in the world, but they still make their hobbies, Pilates, and acai bowls. It's like you could literally, especially given their circumstances, I'm thinking they aren't worried about money, which is why I'm also weirded out when people are like, oh my gosh, you're gonna be hopeless. Like, look at these girls. Do they look like they're working class people? So it is very critical to understand who exactly is trying to sell you the dream, right? Is it a social media influencer? Because in that case, how real is this fantasy, right? And if it's real, does it come from somebody from generational wealth that has that privilege? And that's the thing. The message is promoted to the regular folks, the me, the you, the folks that are working hard, the folks that have been in survival mode their entire life. You know, as much as we would love to live a soft life and radiate feminine energy, I mean, it's not the reality that we live in. What they're trying to sell you is a pipe dream. It's a fantasy. It's a bubble. And honestly, if you're trying to be a stay-at-home girlfriend to a guy that makes $80,000 a year in this economy. So another thing that I want to discuss, which I think is a very important discussion, is that this privilege of being a stay-at-home girlfriend is only applicable or accessible to the white woman. I do not think it's a coincidence that the majority of people posting about their stay-at-home girlfriend routine are white. 
And I think it's just another example of how white women, including myself, have always had the option of like opting out when things get too hard. Um, I don't know who needs to hear this, but if you have the ability to just say, screw it, I'm not going to contribute anything to my community or have any responsibility toward creating social change. Instead, I'm actually just going to make drinks all day and do face masks and eat goji berries is a direct byproduct of whiteness. I mean, if you look at TikTok, that definitely appears to be true. I would argue that it is a combination of race with class. All over the world, this sort of privilege is provided to those that have the means. Now, in the United States, a majority of the wealth does belong to white Americans. As such, it would make sense that the white girls have the privilege or the most access to even live this soft life. And so if you look at it internationally, let's take Saudi Aramco, for example. It is the largest company in the world, and only about 6% of the workforce for that company is women. Now, you can talk about cultural reasons or whatever reasons, there's a lot that goes into that figure. But at the same time, the women there are not working, and it's one of the richest countries in the world, it's one of the richest companies in the world. So across the world, I definitely believe that it is a class thing, a generational wealth thing. But in the United States, it is a little bit more complex because it definitely occurs at the intersection of where class and race actually meet. Let's assume for the sake of argument that you are one of those girls that's like, hey, you sir, you know what? I want to be a stay-at-home girlfriend and I want the soft life and I want to radiate lots and lots of feminine energy. I want to receive. You know what? I'm going to be like, okay, fine. I support you, but answer this. I want you to explain to me what you think the power dynamics of your relationship are going to be. Now, if your family comes from generational wealth and you've had access to money your entire life, it, this doesn't apply to you, right? But if you're like me, for example, and you grew up humble and all of a sudden I'm single again and there's this billionaire investor that all of a sudden is interested in me, all Fifty Shades of Grey style, who do you think has the power in that relationship? And no, not even as a wife, as a girlfriend. Have you guys seen that first season of The White Lotus? Absolutely amazing show. Highly recommended. Did you guys see the, the relationship dynamic of uh, Shane, I believe, and Rachel? That, that young couple that was on their honeymoon? Now that girl, absolutely hot, drop-dead gorgeous, okay? Smart-ish. But she had little to no power in that relationship. I mean, there's a reason people say eat the rich, right? And one of the main reasons is that the person that has the money, they have the power. I see all these content creators glamorizing the fact that they can stay at home all day and do nothing, but here's what they don't tell you. First, in every relationship, there is an equal exchange of value. So if your man is paying for everything, this doesn't mean that you can sit back and do nothing like all these content creators are suggesting. What it means is that you will have to do your part in giving him traditional women benefits. I mean, it's funny because I used to travel a lot for work and one of my coworkers actually told me, he's like, oh, you know, one day, Yusra, you're going to be traveling and you're going to run into like a Qatari prince and you're going to live rich and happily ever after. And I was like to the guy, I was like, are you kidding me? Okay, so I can get controlled for the rest of my life? Um, I don't think so. I am not as cool as Janet Jackson. No matter how many kilojoules of feminine energy I radiate, me being as broke as I am trying to control a multi-millionaire Qatari prince, it's not happening, okay? That's just the reality of the situation. And let's not forget how much temptation actually surrounds wealthy men. I mean, honestly, because if I had to dress up all the time and radiate feminine energy just for a man to stay mine, I don't think it's worth it, to be honest, just to have access to his money. Give me a humble professional man with less than 100 Instagram followers any day, any day. Now, the conversation does get a little bit interesting and complex when you're comparing stay-at-home girlfriends versus stay-at-home moms or housewives. Now, in the United States, at least, if you marry rich, okay, because you're a wife, you have some sort of legal rights that are at least awarded to you. I mean, your power dynamics may be off, but at least when you leave, you can leave with half, right? Eh, partially. For the case of rich men, take Elon Musk, for example, right? That man, I think, is he still the richest man in the world right now? His, his uh, ranking changes every now and then. But he made, I believe his first wife at least, he made her sign a prenuptial agreement, right? So when they divorced, she received a measly amount of his entire net worth. Now, you could argue and say, well, that's still a lot of money. Right, it absolutely is. You are at the mercy of this man and the prenuptial agreement that he makes you sign. Because every rich man is going to make you sign one. He was the income, I was the caregiver. 
and that was how it was going to be. After 13 years of marriage, four kids, a house in the suburb, my husband left and my world just changed literally overnight and I stopped receiving support at all. He had it reduced to zero. I had 13 blank years on a resume. There was nothing I could put down. I mean, mom. And now, for example, if you leave the United States legal system, things get really, really great. Because in other parts of the world, um, the rights for a wife on the case of divorce um, really change, especially when it comes to alimony, um, splitting up assets, things like that. It's very, very different country to country. Okay, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but say, for example, you're a South Asian woman that's living in Pakistan. What type of rights are you going to expect when you actually get divorced or if a man decides to leave one day and you've been taking care of his kids for like two decades and you have no career of your own? I mean, I have so much respect for all the stay at home moms like they're taking care of kids. They're giving up so much to do that. It is a full time job. Actually, no, it's three full time jobs. Okay. And they do it like a soldier every single day. But at the same time, I do have to question and ask even the stay-at-home mom, what is your backup plan in case things go wrong? Are you aware of your rights? Do you have a game plan for if, God forbid, something wrong happens in your relationship or something changes overnight? It, it is very dangerous territory. And this all leads to my final point, which is that I believe that every woman should have or make her own money. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it has to be enough to sustain you. It has to be enough to provide you some form of financial independence. I cannot stress to you how many women I have seen in my own life that have stayed in toxic relationships because they did not have any idea how they would take care of themselves or their kids financially if they were to leave that relationship. I mean, I did a full extensive uh, video on divorce and the ramifications around it. So check that out if you're interested. But it is a rude awakening when you think about the stay-at-home girlfriends out there that don't even have the minimal rights, right? At least the stay-at-home moms and the stay-at-home housewives in the United States, they have some rights. But the stay-at-home girlfriend, there are no legal rights involved at all whatsoever. So how would, you know, you take care of yourself in the case that your boyfriend all of a sudden now wakes up one day and it's like, no, I think I've had enough of you and you've been giving up your career and making smoothies and doing meditation and doing laundry for the past decade and you have no career of your own and no money of your own and no assets of your own. Now, some may say, Yusra, you're being a feminazi, you want all the women out there to work. And I would argue and say, um, instead of blaming feminism, why don't you actually blame capitalism? Now, do I want women to struggle? No, absolutely not. Do I want us all to live soft lives? Of course, I would love to live a soft life myself, you know? I would love to live in a world where things would be easy and I wasn't always in survival mode. And do I want us all to be workaholics and be productivity obsessed? No, of course not. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what, what I would argue is that it is absolutely crucial for women to have their own financial independence and have a backup plan in case life throws a curveball at them. I mean, for decades, women were not allowed to work. They were not allowed to have any financial independence. They weren't even allowed to vote. Even today, we don't have choices when it comes to certain things still. But where we do have a choice, I would highly, highly advise the younger girls or the women out there to really think about it. Be careful with the choice that you have today. Because a lot of what is being sold to us is really just a bubble, a dream, a fantasy, and not accessible really to the average or regular girl. And so I definitely think that as women, we have to be super pragmatic, look at life and the harsh realities for what they are. And if you still want to be a stay-at-home girlfriend, of course, I support women and I support your choice. But one thing I would advise you is to talk to your boyfriend or your partner about the future of your relationship and the future of your finances so that there is at least some protection for you if things go south. And if you're a regular girl, I would highly, highly urge you to make a career for yourself, have some form of financial independence, be able to sustain yourself in the event something goes wrong. Because life can sometimes be absolutely cruel. And if something goes wrong and there's an apocalypse that hits us today, you have more than your feminine energy to handle it.
All right, you guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe. Tell me what you think about this stay at home girlfriend TikTok trend and your thoughts on it, and if you think it's a good idea. I hope you liked it, and I will see you in the next one.